Thanks for coming out. I appreciate you guys showing up. Um, my name is Blake. I am from Columbus, Ohio. I currently work at, okay, all right, all right. I currently work at a church called Movement Church. Uh, I've been there. Sorry, I'm not giving you guys a chance to cheer. Uh, I'm from Movement. Thank you. Okay, great. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> um, I've been there for about four years now. And I am the director, pastor, whatever you want to call it, of family ministry. So that means that I, every one of your kids' classrooms at your church, I would be the person to oversee them. All of your student ministry from middle school up through high school, I oversee them. And then who else is involved in the, in the family? The parents, so I oversee them as well. So I oversee everyone, basically. I'm, like, I'm the lead pastor, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, no, it's good to be with you guys this morning. We're going to be talking about making your faith your own and not your families. But I no longer necessarily believe in that title. So we're going to change it here in just a little bit, okay? All right. If I could go back in time and sat where you sat, because I went to Momentum for four years. I loved it. If I could go back in time and sit where you guys sit right now, I would tell myself, what the Proverbs tell us. I would tell myself to get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, do not turn away from the words of my mouth, do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. <laughs> and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. That's Proverbs 4, 5 through 9. I wasn't a fool. <laughs> I actually grew up in a Christian household. And thank, I came to know the Lord very young, but I didn't know how to properly seek wisdom. I knew that it was important. I knew that I should seek wisdom, but I didn't know how. I sat in your seat and I said, what do I do? And I think youth, I think you guys are often plagued with that same feeling. How do I live the Christian life? What does it mean to be holy and set apart? How do I practically seek wisdom and live for Jesus and his kingdom? Maybe you're here, maybe you came to Momentum and you're like, maybe this year I'll find the answer that I've been looking for. Maybe I'll find it this year. And I hope you do. I hope if you don't know Jesus that you do find him this year. And if you do live for Jesus, if you have been redeemed by Jesus, I hope that I can help explain a little bit more about the Christian life this morning. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to speak as if every single person in this room has been saved by Jesus and has Jesus in their life, is living a life for Jesus. I know that isn't the case, but what I'm going to be talking about this morning is the Christian life. Not necessarily salvation, though this is, where, this is what salvation leads us to. Does that make sense? Okay. Hopefully, there are people in your life who are a good example of the Christian life. Hopefully, your youth pastor is one of them. I hope. <laughs> Hopefully there's some youth leaders here that you look up to. Maybe some older students in your student ministry. Maybe your parents. I, I hope, I pray that your parents are that way. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be pessimistic or say, man, there's no one to look up to. I just want to discuss how we live good, true, beautiful lives. Because only in Christ can we live a good life. Only in Christ can we live a beautiful life. Only in Christ can we live a true life. The Word of God calls us to a lifestyle that we often miss in our modern world, and I want to share it with you. As I said in the time I was uh, asked to present this, and the time that I actually sat down and write it, I won't tell you that last week I started writing this, um, but I kind of came to a different view of family life. Okay, and I want to... I want to uh, I want to talk about this. The title of this power track is Making Your Faith Your Own, Not Your Family's. I think that's good. I think the sentiment behind that is fine. But what that promotes is that 
my faith is my own and it comes from me and no one, no one has any say over it and it's, it's all about me. And that's not the case. That's not what scripture tells us. It's not what God calls us to. It implies a separation of faith from your family. And I don't believe that's the case. It implies that faith comes from within us. And I also don't believe in that. If that were true, if faith came from within ourselves, then no one would have the same faith. No one would have the same understanding of God. God would be different to each and every single one of us because we perceive him differently or whatever. That's not what scripture calls us to. Scripture says there is one true God and we all worship him. The new title of this power track is not making your faith your own, your families. It's taking personal responsibility for your faith. Taking personal responsibility for your faith and living in the roles that God gave you. What we're going to discuss is that we must take personal responsibility. We must take personal responsibility for our faith and the roles that God has placed us in. Because God has placed each of you in a family, in a role, as a male, as a female, to live out God's call on your life where you are. And in that sentence, I said, it's your role, it's where you are, it's your this, that, whatever, but it's where God has called you to and where God has placed you. Because ultimately, God hasn't called us from sin to live a life by ourselves to do whatever we want. He's called us from sin to live inside of his kingdom with him as king. And now we respond dutifully, obediently, not out of fear that we're going to be crushed, but out of freedom from sin. And now we live and love the king. We live for King Jesus. And this morning, I'm going to be talking about just that, the Christian life, how we live this out, okay? Unfortunately, I believe that we've lost part of our understanding about God's world and how we're supposed to live in it. Both, both the secular world and the church world have a misunderstanding of God and, and our understanding of what God wants for humanity I think has been watered down and made very base level. And let me tell you, there is a beautiful life that God wants for you. In his kingdom, in his world. And it's not basic. It's very beautiful. But we've been told a couple lies. And we're going to talk through these first. We've been told a few lies. We've been told... We'll get back to that. We've been told that truth and purpose come from the individual. That's lie number one. That truth... And purpose come from you. You decide what's true. You decide what is the purpose of your life. Let me tell you, that's a lie. We live in a hyper, a super individualistic world. Everything is about you. Everything is about me. I am in front of everyone. It is my dreams that come first. And everything in our world, points more to us. And that's part of the reason why I chose to restate the title of this power track. Because this individualistic mindset has infiltrated the church. Faith is, is not your own. I'm going to explain that. But faith does not come from within you, per se. Okay? It's something given to us by God that we receive as individuals. Okay, Romans 1, 16 and 17 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's us. For in the righteousness of God, for the righteousness of God, for, I'm so sorry, in it, 
in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. We live by faith. It is the power of God for salvation. Unfortunately, we're told today to follow your heart. You be you, boo-boo. Do your thing. We're told to feel your feelings to the fullest. Don't check your feelings. Allow your feelings to rule over you. Validate every single thought and feeling. I'm not trying to throw away emotions. But we have to remember that faith and truth come from God, not us. I don't determine what's true because if I did, then all of you would have to abide by what I say is true. And that's not true. <laughs> We abide by what God says is true. Today, unfortunately, people are ruled by themselves, not self-ruled. People are ruled by themselves. They're not self-ruled. We're going to talk about that. I'll explain that a little bit more for you. Okay? Someone who is ruled by themselves is someone who is ruled by their desires, ruled by their feelings and emotions, and ruled by their passions. Scripture talks about this in multiple different places, but a few that I've provided is Proverbs 6, 6 to 11, and Ephesians 4, verse 14, and then also 17 through 19. I encourage you to look those up later. Those are people who are ruled by themselves. But there's another group of people who I would say we are called to be, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are called to be self-ruled. We are called to be self-ruled. And a self-ruled person is someone who has control over their desires and rules their emotions using this rule to glorify God in their body and life. This is the person who uses their emotions properly and loves God, and loves people. And when they're hurt by someone, they don't, they don't not feel hurt, because we all feel hurt, but they give grace, they give patience, they work through their emotions, they might even need help doing that, because emotions are hard, amen? amen. But they rule over themselves, they rule over their desires. And they submit their desires to the Lord. We've become so inwardly focused, so, so individualized that we've allowed things, we've allowed emotion to rule our lives. We've allowed this thing to rule our lives. We've allowed Snapchat to rule our lives, TikTok to rule our lives, texting. I'm not against this at all. I love this thing. But rather than be ruled by it, we should let this thing be a tool for our lives. Same goes for our thoughts. Same goes for our emotions. Same goes for our friends. Same goes for our video games. Same goes for our sports. We should not let those things rule our lives. We should not let our desires for those things rule our lives. We should rule over them put them in their proper place and enjoy them fully, but at the same time, have them in their place so that God can be in His. Jesus was perfectly self-ruled and He was in control of His temptations. But He did it through being submitted to God the Father. He didn't pull himself up by his bootstraps and do it all by himself and have the, have the self-will to do it. No, when he was out in the desert, in the wilderness, being tempted by Satan, he didn't say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He is, he is Christ. <laughs> he didn't look inward to himself to say, I can do this. He quoted scripture and said, God Almighty rules over me. To be self-ruled, to be self-ruled, we first must 
be ruled by Christ and therefore be ruled by God. The only way to be self-ruled is to submit to Jesus Christ the King. I didn't, I didn't add this on a slide, unfortunately. But if you want to write these down, a couple of verses. Matthew 16.24. I'm just going to give you the references and a little blurb about it. Matthew 16.24. Uh, That's when Jesus says, deny yourself and take up your cross daily. He's basically saying, die to yourself. Die to your desires. Put those things in their proper place and live for me. Matthew 16, 24. Galatians 2, 20. Joel talked about this last night. Galatians 2, 20. We have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It is not my life I live. It's Christ's life. It's God's life. It's the resurrected life of Christ in me. That's why we say we have new life when someone puts their faith in Jesus, because it's no longer I who live, it's Christ's resurrected body. It's Christ's new life that lives inside of me. Galatians 2.20. And then 2 Corinthians 5.17. So it says, put off the old, put on the new. You are a new creation. Anytime that we are ruled by ourselves, or ruled by something other than God, we exchange the truth of God for a lie. And we worship the creature rather than the creator. Romans 1.25, there's another one for you. If we try to rule ourselves, we are ruled by what God made rather than God himself. To be self-ruled, we must first be ruled by Christ. And when we, listen to this, when we are ruled by Christ and, we are, and therefore we are united with Christ, we are therefore co-heirs with Christ. Meaning that we are fellow heirs of the kingdom. Fellow princes and princesses of the kingdom of God. That's your true calling. And one day, the entire earth will be under God's rule. And we will all be part of God's kingdom. So right now, today, we must rule ourselves to take part in his kingdom. If you have been claimed by Christ, if you've given your life to Christ, you are living out the reality of God's kingdom. You are living out God's reality of the kingdom here on earth. We must be self-ruled because this is how we look more like Jesus and live out his kingdom. That's our goal. That's our goal as Christians. If you didn't know, the long-term goal of the Christian is to bring Jesus' kingdom, bring people into Jesus' kingdom, to build the kingdom of God. And there's a couple different ways that people believe that that'll all play out. And we're not here to get into that. But the end goal of God is for there to be a ton of people in his kingdom. One day, Jesus is going to come back. And there's going to be a harvest. And we get to be the workers in the field, preparing the field for the harvest, and harvesting some ourselves. We've been lied to and told that truth comes from ourselves. That, that we decide our purpose. But this only leads us to more and more and more and more and more of ourselves and less of God. May we be like John when he said in John 3.30, he must increase, I must decrease. He must be made glorious. He must be put high, I must be put low. This is our purpose. All right, let's, let's move on to the second lie. Lie number two, you've been told, maybe not by your parents, maybe not by your friends, and it's probably never been explicitly said, but the lie that is being perpetuated right now is that family doesn't have a purpose. That you're just there for however long, 18 years, whatever, and then you get out and you go and you be by yourself and do your thing. And I'm not advocating for you 
sitting in your parents' basement playing video games until you're 40. Please don't do that. <laughs> but family does have a purpose. God loves the family. And this, this, this part's going to be fun. I'll just say that. This isn't going to be a complete conversation on, on this right here. This whole, this whole conversation isn't going to be a complete conversation, but especially to family, because I know that some of you are here this week escaping your family. And not just like, oh, your sister's annoying, so you're here. Like, I'm talking about some of you might be here, and things aren't good at home. And I'm sorry about that. That is not God's design for the family. And it, it breaks my heart. That's part of the reason why I'm in ministry is because when I was in high school, all of my, almost all of my friends came from broken families, came from a place where it just wasn't the most safe at home all the time. And I saw that in my friends, in my peers. And I said, why is that, why is that so? And so I wanted to come into youth ministry to help those people to be a light for those people and to help equip and, and raise up people like me who were raised in pretty okay homes to then raise up good homes. When we are self-ruled, we understand the, our roles within the world that God has created. And part of the world that God created has to do with the family. You might know these verses, but Genesis 1, if you got a Bible, just crack it open. I've already given some Bible verses, but I want us, I want us to uh, open the Bible a little bit this morning. Open up your Bibles or turn them on if you've got the digital version. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read... Verses 26 through 28. You've probably heard these before, but I want you to really, really soak it in, all right? And just just let, it, let it wash over you. Genesis 1, 26 says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds in the heavens, over every living thing that moves on earth the earth. Here, in those three verses, we have a lot going on. So much so that the 50 minutes that we're here together, I couldn't explain it all. I couldn't get through it all. In three verses, there's a lot there. And it's all really, really good, rich stuff. But a few things that I want to point out is, first off, God says, let us make mankind in our image. God, who's he talking to? Not the angels. Because angels don't look like us. He's, he's not talking to the animals because animals don't look like us. God is talking within himself. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We have that image right there. And we're not going to discuss the Trinity. I'm not smart enough to properly explain that all to you this morning in the time that we have. But God is three in one, right? God in Trinity, Trinity in unity. Okay, He is of one substance. Again, we don't have time to get into all of it. But here's what I need you to understand. God created not, not just Adam to be whatever he wanted, not just Eve for her to be whatever she wanted. God created male and female to be together. And part of our likeness, part of our image of God reflects him. There is something within us as individuals that reflect God. But then 
God made Eve for Adam. There is something in marriage that reflects God. Between one man and one woman, we have the distinct genders, and we have holy matrimony, as seen in Genesis 2, which we don't have time to read, but it's there. Personal identity, family identity, marriage identity is something created by God. Its purpose is for God. My personal identity, what was that? That was crazy. Amen. God's, just, God's with us, man. My personal identity, my family's identity, and, and now my wife and I, our family identity is for God. It's not something that I get to decide for myself. It's not something that my family got together and said, we're going we're gonna, to uh, be really good at sports. We're going to be uh, kind of smart. We're not great at school. Um, we're going to do this. No, we don't get to decide that. Our identity, our purpose is for God. Our personal identity, our family identity, our marriage identity, anything that you could identify with is not for you. It's for God. We may, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Ephesians gives us a little more detail on how this relationship in the family structure is supposed to work. Okay, So if you've got your Bibles, go to Ephesians 2 now. Go to Ephesians 2. Oh, goodness. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. It says this. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple. In him... You also are being built together into a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. Now let, me, let me point out a word for you right there. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Members of the household of God. We've got God the Spirit, we've got God the Son, and we've got God the... No, I already said the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit, I'm going backwards. God the Son, and then who's, who's, who's at the top? God the Father, right? God the Father. When you give your life to Christ, again, this is, this is where we're having this conversation. If you are in Christ, you now have a heavenly Father who you answer to. He is the head of the heavenly household. God the Father. You are welcomed into the true household, the true family that you were originally made to be a part of. And if, you're, if your family's at home and it's not a good situation, I'm so sorry. My heart hurts for you. But family has a purpose and that's not it. Family's purpose is to reflect God. Family's purpose is to reflect the person of God. As a, as a husband and wife are one flesh, it's not a perfect analogy, but God is one. Okay, That's how we reflect God. Your family is a family unit. It is one. It reflects God. And as God works for His glory, so our family works for the betterment of our family and the glory of God. Ephesians 5 and 6 then give us the structure for this. And we don't have time to read it or get into it. But Ephesians 5 and 6 describe your role as an individual within the household that is supposed to reflect the household of God. It says, wives, submit to your husbands. It says, husbands, love your wives and be willing to die for them. 
Ladies, I don't have time to, to discuss this whole topic with us this morning, nor, nor is that the, the point of this power track, but I, I want you to understand who God created you to be. Okay? God loves His creation. And at the top of His creation, He put you and me. He put humanity. He put male and female. And He says, He talks a lot about women throughout the Scriptures, but a few that I want to share with you this morning is Proverbs 12.4. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. What does a crown make someone? Royalty. Ladies, you help make your men royalty. Not your boyfriends, your husbands, your future husbands. Proverbs 31.10, an excellent wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. My wife is worth more to me than this entire world. She's, she's my everything. And I've got a little like poem in here that I, I won't say because it'll embarrass her. <laughs> but she is far more precious than jewels. She will be the bearer of my children. I love you. She's the fire in my heart. She's my everything. She does not submit to me out of fear because I push her down. She submits to me because God tells her to. And she loves me and she says, lead me. Lead me. And it's my responsibility to lead our family. That's my role. And it's hard to lead someone as amazing as her. She's not my subordinate. She's not my maid. She's not my mother who picks up after me. She's the wind in my sails. She's the crown on my head. She makes me want to be the king that I'm supposed to be for God. That's a woman. That's a woman. (laughs) Amen? Amen? Ladies, this is your role within the house. And eventually, Ephesians talks about children. So you are not in here, most of you, as wives. Okay? But one day, if you aspire to that, if you aspire to be a part of the household of God, or a part of a household in a way that glorifies God, then you have a purpose. You have a purpose. And your purpose is to reflect God in every part of your life, even in your wifehood. Gentlemen, love your wives. You're not married, so this does not apply to your girlfriend. But you should respect her, because if you don't, your youth pastor should throttle you. (laughs) Notice how all the ladies laughed. None of the guys laughed. (laughs) Love that. Good. And you know I'm not wrong, because you should respect every woman, no matter what, because she's either your sister in Christ, or she needs Christ. She's either your sister in Christ, or she needs Christ. And until you are married and one flesh with her, she is under her father's rule. If not her earthly father, then her heavenly father. You are not her husband. But when you are, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Who loves his wife? He who loves his wife loves himself. No one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. Just as Christ does the church, because we are all members of his body. And then Paul in in Ephesians 5, which is where I'm reading from, quotes Genesis 2 and says, Therefore, or uh, Genesis 1, 
It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Boys, you are to grow into men. And you're, you're well on your way. If you're here in this room, you are well on your way because you chose to come to Momentum. You chose to be a part of Power Track. You chose, you chose to be somewhere where you can learn. So you are well on your way to manhood. Praise God for that. But be men who, like Christ, are willing to die for those you love. Literally die. That's what we're talking about. That's what Paul calls us to. Your role is to nourish and cherish your wife even now. Even while you're still single. It means to love and nourish your wife. So learn how to love God. To love her as you love yourself. To prefer her over everything else. I'm not a simp, but a king respects his queen. Right? A man should respect his wife. Like Christ, we as men must be like a savior to our family. Not that we give them salvation or anything, but Paul literally says, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Be sacrificial for her. Like Christ, you are like a savior. Men who follow Jesus, who was the dragon slayer, must be lesser dragon slayers. We slay the dragons that threaten our family. Through Christ, we become good men. We learn and study who become sages who have wisdom. Husbandmen who foster our households patiently and help it flourish. We are lords who give vision to the house and exercise power and dominion over the house that point to the glory of God, not to the glory of ourselves. As glory bearers who do each of these things in honor of the true king. And this is not true for you yet. You're well on your way. You're well on your way, young men. Keep at it. Keep at it. I've got to skip over the children's part, but that's okay. Um, there's that. Okay, let's go here. Does anyone need that? The purpose of a family is to look like God, reflect His glory, build His kingdom. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's talk about this, okay. Because this also includes respecting your parents currently, okay? This includes respecting your parents. Even if they don't know God, your role as children is to honor your father and mother. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And guess what? If you do, it will go well with you and you may live long in the land. Ephesians 6.3 The purpose of the family is not just to turn 18 and forget about them. The purpose of a family, your family now and your future family, as husbands and wives, is to look like God, reflect His glory, and build His kingdom. We've lost sight of that. And I think we've also lost sight of the church a little bit. Because there's another lie, and it's that church is boring. That you show up on Sunday, you stand up, you sit down, stand up, you sit down, you stand up, you, you sing a couple more songs, you listen to a couple announcements, and then you go to lunch. <laughs> that's the story of church. And that's, that's, not a, that's not a bad thing because that is a very important part of gathering with the body of Christ. But oftentimes we believe that church is boring and, and this, this happens because church is boring sometimes. And it's boring because nothing's happening. It's the same thing over and over and over again. And again, that is a beautiful thing that we can walk into church and praise the Lord. But I, I hope this isn't the case for your church. I'm just simply observing the, the more so American church as a whole. But what I see is that nothing's happening. We're really, really busy doing nothing. 
We're really, really busy doing nothing. We love saying things. We love showing up for people and saying that we were there. But we're, we're really used to sitting on our hands and watching the world go by. We're okay with the sin that runs rampant in our world. We're fine with it. Why is that? Why are we just sitting on our hands doing nothing? When's the last time you, you welcomed some homeless people into your church? When's the last time that you had foster kids in your church for, for an evening to give them some respite, to give them a, a safe place to, to find some joy in life? When's the last time that your church took, took, took some time, maybe not on Sunday morning, but to look back over the 2,000-year project that Jesus started and study what has gone on in church history? When's the last time that your entire church got together? When I say entire church, I mean the kids' ministry and all the loud kids and crying babies are in the same room worshiping God together. Has your church ever done that? We're, we're about to do that, and I'm pumped for it. Because it's usually like all the adults are over here having adult time, and the kids are over here doing their little kitty thing. Let's get everyone together, and let's worship Jesus. Last night was awesome. You guys sounded so good. Listening to your voices while we sang uh, the Phil Wickham, Living Hope. Everyone in the room knew that song. It was awesome. Praise God for that. Why aren't our Sunday mornings like that? I, I'm not knocking our churches to think our churches are, are, are good singers. And like I hear my church singing all the time, and it's beautiful. Let's get everyone together. Sorry, I'm on, I'm on a soapbox on, on that. I'm just excited for when my church does that. We're doing that soon. And I'm just, I'm pumped. I'm very excited. But when's the last time that your church did something with the purpose of it lasting for the next 500 years? Or is it like, hey, we got this thing on Friday. Come on out. It's like an hour. And, the, and then you can go home and go do your own thing. What about the next 500 years? As, as a church, why are we not concerned for the future? Church isn't boring. We've lost sight of the purpose. We've lost sight of God's kingdom here on earth. I'm running out of time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip down to the end. I want to I spend the, the last couple minutes here talking about how we do it. And here's some fascinating things. We'll, we'll end on the church segment with this. Here's some fascinating things about church, okay? Church history. I know you might not like history, but it's fascinating. Church history. Wars that involved the church. That's kind of cool. The Reformation, the Roman Empire. All the guys said, what? Also, the world is not just stuff, if you didn't know that. There is a spiritual aspect to this world. If God made the physical world so detailed, why would he make the spiritual world less detailed? What does that mean? These are the fun questions that we get to ask. Are angels stars? Are stars angels? Scripture seems to say so. Demons are in the world. Lesser spirits are in the world. Where did Jesus go when he died, but before he resurrected? This is fascinating stuff. I hope not just for me. It's a little nerdy. But there's interesting stuff that we've kind of like put off to the side and say, I don't want to really think about that. It's interesting stuff in God's kingdom. Maybe we'd be fascinated by it. Okay, how do we do this, guys? How do we do the Christian life? How do we take everything that we've said so far and apply it to our lives, take it home? Because I've said a lot of great stuff this morning. I just gave myself a huge compliment. I've said a lot of great stuff this morning. But I don't want it to just be like, all right, cool. I wrote it all down. Now I'm going to a session where someone more important is speaking. I understand. Here's, here's the plan, guys. It's three steps. And there's, there's more to it, but here's, here, here they are. Eliminate sin. And when I say eliminate sin, I mean eradicate it. Don't let it be in your life. Like Joel said last night, you're not going to be perfect. You might take your phone on another mission trip when you're not supposed to. But work hard to eliminate sin. There's a saying 
and you can ask me if you want to write it down later. There's a saying that uh, we heard in college that was that said this: "The battle is within. Daily I must fight. Death comes through sin, killed only by Christ's might." If you want it, I can I can say it for you later. Okay. Eliminate sin. Maybe that means deleting social media. Maybe that means right now deleting Snapchat off your phone because you're snapping that person. Images are being sent. You're up way too late texting that person. There are things on your feed and in your algorithm that shouldn't be there. You're very, you're, you're, maybe you're too prone to gossip. Or, or every time your friends take a picture somewhere else, you feel so isolated and so unincluded that it just wrecks you. And those are real feelings, but what if we took that away? Right? What if we eliminated our entertainment? What if we set limits on our phone? Take away the things that are, that are causing you to stumble into sin. Relationships, shows, music. There are great Christian alternatives. I'm not talking about like Flywheel or Facing the Giants or fireproof some of the Christian movies that are fun, but maybe a little cheesy. <laughs> I was very gracious with that, wasn't I? I want to do something crazy right now. I know we're running low on time, but I really want to do it. Okay. Maybe yesterday, maybe this morning, you're, you're thinking through all this stuff and you're like, yeah, I've got, that, I've got that phone that I brought to camp that I wasn't supposed to, like Joel was talking about last night. Yeah, I've got this, this thing that I'm just not really willing to like let go quite yet. What I want to do is I'm, I've got a song I want to play because I like it, and it's a great Christian alternative. Um, and you guys will probably hate it because it's not like Forrest Frank or anyone. But, <laughs> but I want to take a moment, and it's not this big emotional thing. I just want you to make the decision and say, yeah, I'm a... Did I, did I put it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I maybe want to do one of these things on screen. I'm going to take the moment right now while I'm here at Momentum, and I'm going to delete Instagram. Whoa. I'm going to delete that phone number. I'm going to block that person. I'm, going to, I'm actually going to take a moment and just, you don't even have to like bow your head and do anything. You just like do it with your eyes open. Repent to God. And say, Lord, forgive me for that sin. Maybe you need to delete that playlist on Spotify. Okay, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. And if something's if something other or whatever, if you need to do something, if you need to do something, if you need to eliminate sin right now, do it. Okay, 30 seconds. Oh, well. My song's not playing. That's all right. All right. Thank you. Good job. Number two, get the fundamentals down. Nail the fundamentals. The three best answers that you can give in Sunday school, what are they? Jesus, read your Bible, pray. Why is that? Because those are the most important things. Jesus, reading your Bible, and praying. If you don't, if you don't have like a, a structured plan, and I'm not saying it has to be perfect, I'm not saying you have to do it every day, because you're allowed to miss days, But if you don't have a plan or anything, talk to your leader. Talk to a friend. Say, hey, let's read through Proverbs together before school starts. Talk to your youth pastor and say, hey, will you meet with me once a week to make sure that I'm reading my Bible? And also, may I say, reading your Bible and praying, go together. Don't separate them. You, you can. You're allowed to. <laughs> but when you read your Bible, you pray. How do you have a relationship with someone? You talk to them, right? How does God talk to you? 
with words, right? Through God's Word, right? That's why we call it God's Word. God's Word talks to us. God talks to us through the Scriptures, and then we talk back. What's that? Conversation. How do you have a conversation with God? Read Scripture, and you pray. Okay? Nail the fundamentals. Hear me, hear me, hear me. This isn't a joke. Nail the fundamentals. Nail them. Go get them. Go get them. Do it right. Read your Bible and pray. Romans 12, 2 says this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When we read and pray, when we read Scripture and pray, we are not performing for God so that He sees us and says, good job. We are being formed by God. We are not performing for God. We are being formed by God. Another way that you can nail the fundamentals is participate in church. Participate in what your church is doing. Be dedicated to the body of Christ and be concerned for its well-being. I know church isn't always the most exciting place to go. But go be part of the body of Christ. Go serve the body of Christ. And be dedicated to it. Be dedicated to God. And finally, have a relationship with others who are heading in the same direction. They can be people in this room. They can be your parents. Because your parents do know maybe just a little bit more than you do about this stuff. Your, your youth pastor, your leaders, have relationships that are going to call you forward. Okay. Finally, I want to end with this. Build something that's going to last. Like I said earlier, we should have some concern about what the church is going to look like in 500 years. What is your 80-year plan for your life? What are you going to build? Maybe your plan is to be a, be a wife and be a mom and to raise up fellow glory bearers who are made in the image of Christ, in, in the image of God. What a great way to build the church. <laughs> Want a few more people in your church? Go have some babies. <laughs> when you're married, when you're married. That was, that was my bad, guys. That was my bad. <laughs> But here's, here's the deal. Here's, here's what, I, what I realized in high school when I was sitting in your seats. That's when I, I felt my call to ministry. I thought God was pushing me in that direction because I saw some, some brokenness in my family and friends. Not my family. I mean, my family has brokenness. But my friends' families, right? I said, why, why, why is there families that are hurting? I don't want my family to be that way one day. When I'm a husband and when, when I have children, I don't want my family to be that way. I want to be the best husband I can be and the best father I can be. Not so that I can like parade my children around and say, look at my Simba. Look at him. Look at him. No. So that those children can come to know the Lord and we can spend eternity together. And then their children will know the Lord. And their children will know the Lord. And their children will know the Lord. That's part of my 500-year plan. Build a legacy. Some of you, your grandparents are Christians. Your great-grandparents are Christians. You are living out the legacy that maybe your great-grandparents had, your great-great-grandparents had, down through the generations. How beautiful is that? That's what I want. Be bound to your duty as a follower of Christ. And everyone laughs because I say duty. Be bound to your duty. Be bound to what you've been called to. If you profess the name of Jesus, live inside of that. Not one foot in, one foot out. Be inside of that. And be bound to it. Not because... 
you're, you're so terrified that God's going to send you to hell, but because you're so grateful that God saved you from your sin. Be bound to your life as a Christian. Take responsibility for your, for your faith today. Eliminate sin. Get the fundamentals right. And build something that's going to last. I love you guys. Let's build the kingdom of God together. All right, let me pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these students and their willingness to, to be here at Momentum and just be a part of your family. Lord, I pray for each and every single one of us, Lord, that we would, we would take steps towards you, but also, but also understand that this is a lifelong journey. That we walk with you. We walk with you, Lord, and that you walk with us. May we be bound to our duty as Christians to be strong followers of you. And may, be, may these young men and women grow up to be mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, part of a family, part of a church, and even as individuals, people who reflect you. Lord, may we reflect you. May we reflect you. May we look more like you. We love you, Lord. We are so grateful for your son, Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks, guys. See you later.